Hi, I'm Jim Buller. Uh, I've been an upper elementary and academy Bible teacher for many years. Uh, I've also taught wilderness survival and uh, various wilderness and primitive skills for a long time. Um, I have a ministry called Preparing to Stand. Uh, it deals with uh, practical Christianity, uh, end time prophecy studies, country living in preparation for the end times, and wilderness survival in preparation for the end times. Uh, for this particular video series, we have a companion book that goes with it. Um, this will be available on the www.preparingtostand.org website under the resources menu. Um, so if you want to download it, uh, you can go there and, and get it. Uh, let's talk for a moment here at the beginning about why it's important to have an end time Christian perspective. And I want to draw our attention to the foolish man who built on his house on the sand. Uh, it's kind of hard for us to get into his head and, and understand why he would build on the sand. And a big part of that problem, I think, is because we know the end of the story. So I don't care how good his reasons were, uh, how compelling his reasons were, none of that matters to us, again, because we know the end of the story. And from the perspective of the end of the story, what is wise and what is foolish is pretty obvious. Uh, however, before then, it's not so readily apparent. And so we still need to trust God's wisdom. Now, fortunately, God is, you know, knows the end from the beginning, and he's promised us in Amos 3, verse 7, Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And so if we want to, you know, know the end from the beginning, from God's perspective, we need to study the prophecies, uh, and they'll tell us what's going to happen, the end of the story, so to speak. Uh, if we're wise, we'll do, <clears throat> we'll do that. And so looking at the end of the story, there's a lot that's going to happen between now and when Jesus comes. Uh, however, just before Jesus gets here, God's people, uh, because of a death decree, are going to be fleeing to the most desolate and solitary places, as it says in Great Controversy, page 626. And so <clears throat> learning wilderness survival isn't just some fun activity that we're doing or something that's interesting to do or even something that's good to know just in case we get stuck in the woods someday because if we're going to be staying true to God, we're going to be doing it. And from looking at what's going on in the world, we see this is going to be happening soon. And so we'd be wise to get ready and prepared for this time. And that's the subject of our video here. Now, just before we get started, I need to bring up one other point is, you know, a lot of people might look at that end time picture and just think, I can't do this. And that's true. Uh, and that's why Jesus told us in John 15, verse 5, he says, you know, without me, you can do nothing. And his answer to that is for us to abide in him. And so our focus really needs to be on abiding in Jesus and working with him as he works to prepare us. Uh, as he's promised to do. To begin with, um, let's look at the survival priorities. These are the things that we need in order to keep alive. Uh, they're listed in order of importance, and there's five of them. Uh, the first one is shelter. The second one is water. The third one is various health concerns like safety, sanitation, hygiene, getting adequate rest, all those things that we need to do to stay safe and healthy. Uh, the fourth one is fire, and the fifth one is food. Now, the reason they're in this particular order is within hours we're going to want shelter from something. Uh, so that what's puts it first. Water is second because we could get into the next day without water. Uh, food's last because we can go a couple weeks without food. Might not feel real good about it, but we'll live. And health concerns is in the middle. It kind of umbrellas over all of them. You always want to stay safe and healthy. I mean, even under normal situations, whatever that is for you, if you were to get sick or injured, your situation just got way worse. And you for sure wouldn't want that to happen in a survival situation. So you always want to stay safe and healthy, you know, and have good hygiene and sanitation so that you don't get sick and, and have problems that way. 
Fire is also in the middle. Is it also kind of umbrellas over all of them? Uh, you want fire possibly in connection with your shelter for light and or heat. Fire to boil water to purify it. Uh, fire to cook food. Fire to make tools and so on. So that's why they're in this particular order. Now, as we practice or actually do survival, it's uh, possible for us to do a lot of damage to nature. And so it's important that we have what we call a caretaker attitude. And uh, this actually has its roots way back at the very beginning in the first job that God gave Adam and Eve to do, to take care of the garden. And as their children, you know, kind of by extension, we have that same job. Unfortunately, people haven't followed God's plan real well throughout the ages, and we've come close to trashing the planet. But God still cares about his creation. And so there is in Revelation 18, verse, excuse me, Revelation 11, verse 18, uh, a, as part of a declaration that's made up in heaven, uh, you know, like just before Jesus comes, like now is the time for you to go back and reclaim your earth, uh, that says the time has come to destroy those who have destroyed the earth. And so God still cares about his creation. And it's important that we have a caretaker attitude. Now it's actually quite possible for us to get everything we need from nature and still leave nature better off than we found it. And I just want to give an example here. Um, <clears throat> this is a digging stick. Uh, this is your primitive multi-tool. Uh, we'll be talking more about it as we get into the video series here. Um, so this is something you'd want to make uh, fairly early on in your survival situation or even before. Uh, and because of all the, it's, all the different uses that you have for it, I mean, it's called a digging stick because uh, it's used to dig up wild edible roots. Uh, but also it's for any digging task, like digging cat hole to go to the bathroom and so on. By the way, uh, dig the hole with this. Do not use this to cover it up. Don't risk contaminating it because of the, all the other uses that you're going to need it for. Uh, it can be a pry bar. Uh, put your cook pot in and out of the fire as a poker for the fireplace. Um, it's also known as a throwing stick because it can uh, be thrown to bring down small game and so on. Uh, but anyway, let, because of a lot of these uses, you need a nice, strong branch. And so you're not going to want to just pick up some stick laying on the ground. Uh, stick laying on the ground, who knows how long it's been there. It had to get rotten enough up in the tree to break and fall off. And then laying on the ground, it's getting more rotten all along. And so, yeah, for some of these uses, you could just use a stick laying on the ground. But for a good quality tool, you're going to want to cut something that's either very recently died or still green. And so practicing caretaker attitude in our choice of a stick to make the digging stick out of, uh, we're not going to pick that perfectly shaped little sapling over there that even though it's just, you know, the right shape and everything, but it's growing by itself. Uh, and so if we were to take that tree out, you know, that would leave that area vacant and that tree needs to be growing in that spot. Instead, let's go somewhere where things are growing too thickly together and they need some thinning or pruning uh, or take a branch off of a tree where it's not going to hurt things. And so we've gotten what we need and we've actually left nature better off by doing some thinning and pruning. A lot of the activities uh, that we will be doing in connection with surviving in the wilderness uh, require the use of a knife. And so let's talk about knife safety here just a little bit at the very beginning of all of this. Um, <clears throat> several years ago, uh, a group, Pathfinder group asked me to uh, share a list of, I forget whether there's eight or ten different knife safety rules to a group, and I started trying to collect uh, that number, and I was having trouble coming up with that many. And I remember once I, I kind of sat down and looked at the ones that I'd gotten already so far, and I realized that they were all really expressions of one basic rule. And so I call that uh, the number one most important knife safety rule. Uh, like all the other ones uh, kind of spring out of, you know, it's much easier to remember one rule than, oops, I forgot number nine and I just cut myself, right? So um, <clears throat> what that rule is, 
when whenever the knife is out of the sheath or if it's a pocket knife whenever it's open always be thinking where is it going to go if it slips okay uh, you know carve away from you why because what slips it goes out there and not into you uh, when you hand the knife to somebody you hold the back of the blade offer them the handle why because if it slips they don't get cut you don't get cut and so just always be thinking whenever you're using the knife always be thinking where's it going to go if it slips along with the knife category though there's other sharp edge cutting tools that we need to th think about uh, knife you're doing a lot of uh, tasks with that such as fine carving and meal preparation and so on uh, but for some more serious wood shaping uh, it's nice to have some kind of a light chopper which could be uh, like a uh, some kind of a bush knife or a machete something like that uh, or possibly uh, a small hatchet like this uh, something that you can do some light chopping work with uh, such as for shaping uh, the point on the digging stick uh, or uh, cutting branches off of a pole that you're going to use for a shelter pole so that they don't poke you and you don't poke uh, holes in the tarp. Also something that really is going to come in handy is a lightweight folding uh, camp saw or a pruning saw. Uh, something like this. Uh, we'll illustrate this in a little bit here. Um, is going to really come in handy and so that same rule applies to all of these uh, different sharp edge cutting tools whenever it's out of its sheath uh, you're always thinking where is it going to go or when it slips um, and and be you know safe from that perspective now because we're frequently in groups we need to also consider the group and so there's a concept that uh, we heard recently or somewhat recently anyway, and uh, that's been really helpful and it's called a blood bubble. Uh, blood bubble is kind of a sphere bubble shape around you that's anywhere this blade could reach, okay? That's your blood bubble. And so potentially anybody that's in your blood bubble could also get cut if you slip. And so if you're carving away and somebody walks through your blood bubble, like I'll just stop and let them pass through and then I'll keep going, uh, but if they stop to talk, then I'm going to tell them, you know, you need to stand out of my blood bubble so I don't slip and cut you. Or at least stand over here on this side while I'm cutting this way. When I switch directions, then you're going to have to move. So uh, in a group setting, you also want to be thinking about uh, your blood bubble. Okay, we want to talk a bit about some different knife carving uh, techniques here. And to kind of illustrate uh, that as well as the need for the, the various uh, other sharp edge cutting tools, uh, we're going to go back to the digging stick again. So picture this growing on a tree. It's a branch growing on the tree. You know, what would be the best tool to cut it off with? Well, of course, that would be the saw. And so we're going to take the saw and we're going to cut it, you know, kind of picture what part of the branch we're wanting to use. Uh, I like most of the the digging stick to be relatively straight with a little bit of curve. I mean, that's my personal preference. Some people like them totally straight. Some people like them more curved. Uh, but this gives, um, you know, kind of a little hook there that I can use to, to grab some stuff with uh, along with the notch that's there. Um, but most of it being fairly straight for when it's being used like a pry bar or fireplace poker or whatever. So, uh, you know, just picture in the branch what part of the stick we're wanting to use. And then we're going to use the saw to cut it roughly to shape. Okay. Uh, then we'll take uh, one of the light chopping tools. And we would chop, okay, to make the point. Uh, do that part. Also would chop off any branches that are on here. Um, if there were any. I uh, could use either the the bush knife or machete or the hatchet for that. And then we'll take the knife <clears throat> and peel it and make it smooth all the way up and down so that you can run your hand all over this without snagging on anything.
One thing that really helps us be safe when we're doing different uh, types of carving is a chopping block. Uh, if you're just trying to carve out here in the air, notice that you're having to push down to get the knife to bite in, which means you're having to push back up with your other hand. And so you're just expending a lot of extra energy. On the other hand, if you have it on a chopping block, it's right there. All my energy can go into controlling the cut. Uh, rather than having to bite into the wood. Uh, <clears throat> however, when you're cutting at the end of the cut, at the end of the cut, your knuckles can slip and hit the chopping block and that can become very uncomfortable and bloody. So when you're working with this, hold your work towards the edge of the chopping block so that the blade, when it hits, you know, as you're carving, it hits the, end, the chopping block, your knuckles are over here well out of the way. Another technique I uh, want to demonstrate here with this is batoning. Uh, since you have the digging stick anyway, we're going to use it as a mallet here. And uh, a lot of times you'll need a friend to step in and help a little bit. You want to baton, right? Okay. Yeah, the, the friend can either do the batoning or hold the stick. Uh, just depending on how it works here. Um, you actually need to be on this side. Okay, so batoning, you're going to hit... Okay. This is cedar wood and it cuts real easy. Uh, when you're using oak or something like that, you'll see the value of the batoning. But with the batoning, uh, you can be very precise. You're almost like doing chisel work. Uh, it can be very precise with your angling and cut just what you want to cut. And you can also make very strong cuts. The other nice thing about batoning is if you need to split, this works very easily. Um, and for those kind of cuts. So use a chopping block whenever possible uh, and batoning is a, a good technique to become familiar with. Now you're not going to find a nice chopping block like this out in the woods necessarily. So you might be using the top of a log. It might be helpful to take one of your chopping tools and flatten out the top so you have a good workspace there. Uh, something that you, you know, can have your knuckles out of the way. Uh, just, you know, see what you can find and do the best with what you're able to, to come up with. Okay, since uh, shelter's the number one priority, let's talk about shelters a little bit. Now, where you set up your shelter uh, has a lot to do with how comfortable you're going to be. Uh, you need a place that's open where the breeze can blow through, which will uh, cut down on like uh, insects and stuff like that. Um, also get a good breeze, you know, which might be nice when it's hot and you have some cooling wind blowing through. Uh, you also want to be close to resources such as water, uh, materials for to build your shelter with, uh, an area that's going to be safe for fire. Uh, if you're going to have a fire in connection with your shelter and so on. So just, you know, think about those things and then try to find a place where you got some relatively flat ground that you can work with. Uh, with those resources uh, around the area. Uh, to start with here, we're going to make a model debris hut, which uh, is a, a shelter that you can build entirely from natural materials. Uh, we're just going to make a model for the sake of time and materials, and uh, you'll get the idea there. Hey, let me introduce you to my helper, Adon, here. Thank you for coming and helping us. Uh, we've already gathered a bunch of sticks, uh, which is where you would start with building the debris shelter. And we're going to choose through these sticks uh, to find some that have some natural branches in it about the same length. Uh, we're going to build this particular shelter uh, off of a tripod, uh, which we need three sticks for that. And a nice strong ridge pole, probably your longest uh, straightest one will be your ridge pole and then make this nice and sturdy. Okay, so this is going to be for about a person maybe this tall, okay? Uh, that's the scale we're using here. Now what we're going to do next is we're going to put 
what we call ribbing. You know, it's like your ribs ribbing along here. We're just going to build it on one side so that you can still see the inside of the shelter uh, and what we're doing there. Uh, the main thing we're trying to show here is this construction method. So let's go ahead and put some ribbing on. Okay, go ahead. No, okay. Not on this side. No, no, it's too long. That's that's in too far. short ones coming around here. I'll we'll just, we're not going to go all the way up to the end. That short one there? Yeah, one more short one. Is there another short one? Yeah, that was perfect. Okay. Now, one problem that a lot of people have is it's real important to have this edge straight. Uh, the sticks aren't always going to be the same, you know, length or the right length. But try as much as possible to have a straight line here along the outside rather than the sticks going in and out where their bases are touching the ground. That'll, that'll just be more efficient that way. The other thing is we don't want the sticks to stick above the ridge pole very much. Uh, this one here is probably sticking up. These two are probably sticking up the most. That's sort of okay, uh, but any place where the sticks stick way up above here, it gives a place for heat to escape and rain to get in. So we want to be able to cover this over with debris, which is the next thing we're going to do. Um, and since we're just building a one-sided, uh, we're not going to have a lot of debris on top. But the important thing, again, is not to have your sticks sticking above the ridge pole uh, very far. Because we're building a model, we've been bringing in handfuls about like this. If this was a full-size one, we'd be wanting to bring in handfuls like this. So uh, just keep that in perspective. Uh, if you're just bringing in, you know, like handfuls like this, it's going to take you a long time to bring, get enough debris to build a full-size one of these. Now, when you bring in the debris, start on the outside. You can help and just lay the debris, start at the bottom and put it in layers, uh, working the way up until you get to the top. And one more on the very top right there. Okay, we need to gather a little bit more. Okay. So, uh, what do you think would happen if a big wind came along? Okay, oh, uh, it would probably blow, yeah, blow all this off. And so we need some other sticks, probably save back some heavier ones to lean against the outside. We need to go gather a few more of these too, um, to lean against the outside to keep the, they don't have to be real close together, but just enough to keep the wind from blowing things away. Okay, now all these extra sticks that we gathered for our shelter, they aren't wasted at all because we will need a fire and so all of this can become firewood. Um, we saved the inside of the shelter, preparing that for last. Uh, I made the mistake once of um, building a debris hut and, and I found some nice, clean, dry debris that I wanted to put inside my shelter uh, because you will lose more of your body heat to the cold ground than to the cold air and so you want a good layer of debris uh, on the ground that you're sleeping on top of. Now this makes things more comfortable but more importantly it, it insulates you from the ground. Uh, so anyway I found this nice <clears throat> clean stuff and I thought oh that's perfect for inside and I put it in the shelter uh, then I went back to building the outside of the shelter with all kind of debris and, and you know bits and dirt and everything fell down through the ribbing onto my nice clean stuff and guess what it wasn't clean anymore 
So I pulled it out, threw it on top of the shelter, and went back and got some more, which wasn't quite as nice as what I had the first time. So when you get ready to put the debris on the inside of the shelter, kind of you know clean away any sticks or rocks or lumps or whatever might be there, and then you're going to bring in some nice clean dry material. Uh, take the, pick the sticks out of it, or you'll have to do it in the middle of the night while you're trying to sleep, and I'm just going to go in through the side here because it's easier that way. Actually, you'd be going in through the door. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And you want a nice layer of debris here to sleep on. Again, any sticks goes to the firewood pile. So none of this is wasted. Now this debris that we're using here is pine needles. Um, it could be dried leaves or moss or ferns, uh, anything like that, that uh, gives you a fluffy uh, insulative layer. Okay, I think I'll just stop there. Did you see the ribbing and then the debris bed? Now, if this was uh, being built, you know, an actual size, actual one that you're going to use, and if it was cold outside, you'd want this debris layer on the outside of the shelter to be fairly thick, uh, even up to three or four feet or more, uh, depending on how cold it is. Also, uh, the debris bed inside, uh, you want that to be nice and thick. Uh, especially if you're working with leaves. Leaves will squash down uh, a lot. Uh, I remember I had a debris bed once of like sycamore leaves and it was this tall when I started out and by morning it was almost down to nothing. Just the leaves had squashed flat. And so if you're using leaves especially, fill it up, crawl in and squish them down, you know, fill it up again. Um, so this isn't, you know, again, this is for a person about this kind of tall. Uh, this isn't uh, like a hut that you would spend time inside. It's more of a glorified sleeping bag than, than a, a, a shelter, you know, that you would spend time uh, doing things in besides sleeping. So uh, the doorway, you would want to, you know, block off the doorway as much as possible. Leave just an entrance big enough for you to crawl in and then figure out some way that you could close off the door. Okay, I want you to think just a minute about uh, how much work and materials, uh, you know, time gathering the materials and then putting it all together, how much that's going to be for to actually build a full-size one of these for one person. Um, and we'll come back to that idea in just a bit. Uh, but also, we're usually going out in groups. And so imagine trying to build one of these for each person in the group. Now these are basically one person shelters. Um, they're trying to, you know, you build them low to the ground because heat rises and you want to keep that heat down by you when you're sleeping. And so if you make the shelter wider, that means it has to also be taller. Uh, probably the biggest one we've ever made of this was like a four person one and it wasn't that warm just because it had that extra height up in the top of the shelter that a lot of our body heat was going to. And so this is just a one person, maybe a two person shelter. Um, so for a group, what could we do that's better? You know, cause I mean, this just to build a bunch of these uh, it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of materials that may not be available in the area. Uh, if it is available in your area and you want to do that, fine. Uh, just one bit of caution there. We took a group, actually this has happened both with a group of kids and with a group of adults. Uh, and everybody kind of picked their spot for their shelter and made their shelter. But by morning, everybody was around the fire pit, you know, in both of those groups. I mean, that's just the way it works. And so force yourselves to build your shelters all in one location because somewhere in the middle of the night, everybody wants to be together. Uh, and so they even abandoned their well-built shelters for the sake of being together, you know, and the fire pit was like the central area. And so that's where everybody ended up. So 
because of that and because if you build a larger version of this like a group shelter version using the same type of construction method okay uh, just imagine one maybe you know five six feet tall uh, seven eight feet across the front of it you know you could put four or five people in there uh, and maybe build a couple of these facing each other or we've had uh, several of them like four or five of them around a campfire uh, area uh, again, you want to be really careful with fire because you're sleeping in a big tinder bundle here. Uh, but we have used fire, you know, just again, being really careful with it. Uh, and make sure that, you know, somebody is watching the fire all through the night. You kind of take turns fire watching. Uh, and keeping the fire going and making sure that everything's staying safe. But um, <clears throat> just, you know, know that, that using this same basic method, you can build larger group shelters. And in any given situation, that may actually be the better way to go. Uh, it's what we've done, you know, several times. Uh, and with a group, that tends to work better than everybody trying to make their own one-person shelter. I just want to tell you a story here. There was a group of us that had gone out on a practice survival trip, and uh, we were building our shelters, you know, at that stage in our, our setting up camp. And my friend Brian looks over to me and he says, you know, Jim, um, one way or the other, you got to do the work. And I you know, looked at him like, what do you mean? And he says, well, you know, when you get to camp, you have to do the work. You need a shelter or you can carry something in to make the, make the building the shelter easily. And so we thought and talked about that quite a bit. And we've done a lot of experimentation with that over the years. But I wanted to share that principle with you because that applies to many things. It's just real easy to demonstrate here with shelter. And since we're doing shelters first, uh, that you know just brings it out into the open right away. And that's the idea that one you need, you're going to need certain things when you get to camp. You know, in this place in case we're talking about shelters, you're going to need a shelter uh, unless the weather's really really nice. You're going to need a shelter and so one way or the other you have to do the work. Okay, and what we've discovered is it's easier to bring in a lightweight tarp and some cordage uh, here to help tie it up uh, than it is to build one of these every time you spend the night.